My name is Jonathan Goldsmith. I, along with Jenny Sykes, were the owners of Spockenop, the pizzeria here in Chicago. And I'm so happy to be here with my cherished good friend, John Arena, uh, I, who uh, is so gracious to can think of me as a colleague uh, and think of me as his mentor. And of course, I think of John as, as uh, my mentor. Uh, I think John uh, early on, uh, when we first met, which was through Penny Pollock, who was doing a book on pizza, years ago had come to visit with his cousin, Sam, a fellow owner of Metro Pizzeria. And uh, John liked who I was and how I was thinking, and I think he still does. So I have a, a Neapolitan pizzeria called Spockanopoli. We've been around for about 15 years. And the first question, Drew, Drew as I understand from Alex, was, how did I get here? So, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, we, my wife, Jenny, who is an artist, we ended up in Italy and Florence in 1988 in the service of her studying Tipo Classico. I was a house husband in Florence in charge of our 18 month uh, daughter, Sarah Rose. And I was gonna stay at home, take care of her while Jenny studied at the Atelier Cecil Graves. And that led to where I am right now. We lived in Italy for three and a half years. I was a Casalingo, which is the male pronunciation of Casalinga, housewife. And I was responsible for the daily shop, taking care of Sarah and I had the good fortune, or we had the good fortune over the three and a half years to go beyond Florence to live in the Gargano, in, Vico, in Rodi Garganico in Puglia, where I was a Benino, a bath boy. And all these things led to wonderful, rich, uh, incredible experiences that uh, created a, a, an impermeable bond with Italy that will never, never uh, diminish. And we returned uh, back from Italy in 91. We continued to uh, go back to visit both to Florence and to the Gargano and by chance in 90 in 2003, which was 12 years after we had left Italy, uh, somebody by chance on a plane to Rome on our way to Rodi uh, suggested that I consider a pizzeria. And sure enough, uh, uh, that summer at the end of the summer, I came home. I told my wife I wanted to take a passeggiata. I bought another ticket to Italy and I went to Naples because my friends in Naples said pizza is good. Go west, young man, go to Naples. and. That was the start of a, a voyage, a journey that I'm still on today. I'm John Arena from Metro Pizza in Las Vegas. Along with my cousin, Sam, we founded our, our pizzeria in 1980. We actually started making pizzas together in 1967. So I've been at it over 50 years now. Um, my story is not quite as romantic as Jonathan's. Uh, I was born into a pizza making family so I kind of uh, had no, as a child, I had no choice. And I was lucky enough to find that my vocation was also my avocation over time. I've been friends with John now well over 15 years and he's become sort of my spiritual conscience and uh, my compass. You know, um, my outlook on pizza has changed quite dramatically over the years and has evolved. And I think that's similar to what happens with our dough itself. Our dough, evolves in, during, during its uh, maturation process. And I think as pizza makers, we should continue to evolve and mature and develop complexity. So what is, what is, uh, what is my principal practice? Uh, there are so many doughs, there's so many methods, there's so many different types of pizza. Uh, there's so many different schools of thought. Uh, uh, I'm trying to, incorporate other methods uh, of dough, dough making, uh, but my true practice uh, that I embrace from day one, which I continue to embrace, and I continue to try to figure out uh, what I can do to uh, make it, uh, take it a step further, is from my study with Enzo Cocha, which dates back uh, from my first study in Naples in 2004. And that basically is a, a direct method uh, with the notion with using fresh baker's yeast and the notion of uh, meno lievito più leggero, 
that there's this, uh, the idea of a, a longer rise uh, in the service of digestion. The Italians talk about come di gerivole. I am very excited when I have Italians, especially from Naples, come into the pizzeria and they, they try the pizza and the first comment is come di gerivole. How, how digestible? I think there are as many, as many different methods as there are pizza makers. And it's important when you start out to trying to determine what your method is gonna be or what your ingredients are gonna be, what your formula is gonna be, that you first have a very clear idea of what your destination is. And then, then it just becomes a matter of how do, I, how do I get there? And like all destinations, there are many different routes to get to the same place. So people tend to look at pizza dough when they start out and say, and they start with, uh, I want to use this particular, I want to make this particular type of pizza, or I want to, I want to use this particular ingredient, or I want to use this particular equipment. But really what you're trying to do is identify first and foremost, what you want the end, the ideal end result to be. And then you build to that by developing your skills, by developing your technique, by looking clearly at what your vehicle, your mode of transportation is. And by mode of transportation, I mean, what I mean, basically dough management, which John alluded to, you know, so different conditions, you know, different Neapolitan pizzerias across the world have to use a different route to get to their end result. They're all trying to achieve the same goal, trying to get to the same destination, but based on their own personal considerations, they have to modify that. And the only way you can do that is to have a clear understanding of what the different variables will do to the finished product. And that's really more important than saying I use indirect method, I use direct method, I use natural leavening, I use I use a biga, I use a starter, I use a I use a poolish, I blend flowers. Really, in the at, at the end, it's all in service to the pizza. I have to identify in my mind what my ideal is, then I have to use my expertise, my knowledge, and in consultation with my colleagues, I have to use any information that I can that I can gather to get to where I wanna be. So in my case, for my standard New York style pizza, I use, a, I use direct method. I use a very long fermentation. And my vision of long fermentation is probably quite different than John's. John's idea of long fermentation might be 24 hours. My idea of long fermentation might be five days, depending on what my final uh, result should be. Mm -hmm. And then I adjust, I modify and adjust based on what my goal is. You know, a pizzeria may want to achieve the same goal that I achieve or something similar, but not have the same conditions that I have. For example, I have a lot of room to store dough. An average New York pizzeria in Manhattan doesn't have a 5,000 square foot space to, to, to use as their laboratory. So they have to make adjustments. So the, mo the thing that I would say to start out with, the most important critical condition feature is to have a very clear idea of what your destination is. And then you then all of your choices become based on that. Let me start with just uh, for those who are old enough to remember the book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, I think there's a difference uh, between John and I, one, one difference. I truly, there are many things that uh, we, I think we're truly cut from the same cloth in, in terms of what we want to do uh, in terms of our communities. Uh, if I remember correctly from the art of uh, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, there was the one guy who would ride the motorcycle, enjoy the, you know, the breeze and the scenery. And then there's the other person who, and I think there was links to how we would uh, approach life philosophically. And then there's the, the, other, the other person who really knows the intricacies of the engine and how it functions. And so you're gonna have to ask John about the fermentation. I, I mean, I think I was taught what to do, but I, you know, when I think of Enzo Kocha and, and the, the, the month of study that I did with him in Naples, I think he gave me an outline for what I would need to learn over a lifetime, the 50 years that John already has under his belt. So I think if you ask me what is fermentation, I couldn't even tell you what fermentation is in terms of the science between it, you know, the alcohols, the sugars, the different glucoses, the various starches, and, and, and what, what evolves. Um, 
the what I what I what I just what I find is that in in our practice that that longer rise in terms of digestion works. What I what I find now when I go back to the practice of the eight hour with the, the more yeast that I'm finding that I it, it's it's not ready. And John will talk a great deal, and I think I would love for him to talk about this. About it's all about time and temperature. It's it's very very simple. And I find in our in our practice, uh, you know, I, I have my my cousin Evan Goldstein is a great wine person, and people will send him wines that they've made, and he'll often say, well, how many years? How how old are the vines? And he'll graciously say, well, the vines need more time. And that sometimes I I will uh, in my daily practice of communicating with the pizza bank, you know, the the ones who are handling the dough. They're really going to tell me how the dough is in terms of extending memory, et cetera. Um, so we're really just trying to work with time and temperature. And it's and each day is different in terms of the environment. We try to take our knowledge of how to foster the best product we 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 can. But I, I'd rather have John talk about the fermentation process itself as a as a teaching model. So let's talk about fermentation a little bit. In the context of making pizza dough. When we talk about fermentation, we're talking about more than just the chemical process of conversion of starches and sugars and alcohol. We're talking about br really bringing the dough to its to its optimal condition. And now we're talking in that regard, we're talking about texture, flavor, the uh, development of carbon dioxide trapped within the within the structure of the dough, uh, extensibility. We want all of these things to happen to reach their their optimal condition at the same time. And that means having control over the product. That means having, typically, as John mentioned, we're talking about time and temperature. So if in my, in my case, if I'm making a dough that's gonna be used five days later, I have to calculate or through experience, I have to modify my dough so that under, under my conditions, that dough will have reached its optimum in all of the different categories that I'm looking for at the same exact moment. And for me, the way to do that is through cold fermentation, because cold fermentation is very predictable. I put it in a walk-in box that's always going to be 38 degrees. You know, if you're putting it in a in a room, for example, the room temperature may fluctuate five or six degrees during the course of the day or during the course of the evening. So for me, I'm using my my uh, cooler as a fermentation room, and I want to slow that process down because I'm looking for the development of acetic acid the development of, of uh, lactic acid. And that's where the flavors are gonna come from. The flavor comes from the bacteria. The yeast is more of a textural component in most cases um, for our purposes. So it's important for me to get all of, the, all of the things that I'm looking for to happen at the same time. So it's a really, a, you're orchestrating the, the dough itself to reach its, its optimal conditions at the exact same moment. So we want it to be workable, we want it to be uh, flavorful, we want it to have the aromatics that we're looking for, we want it to have the textural components that we're looking for. And we do that through, through manipulation of time. Everything that we do when we make pizza dough is about manipulating time. A biga, a pre-ferment, a pre the temperature, those are all, the amount of yeast, those are all ways of manipulating time. If you're using a, a pre-ferment or, or a, a sourdough starter, for example, you're trying to basically create a dough that has the properties of a very old dough in a, re in a relatively short amount of time. And that's what the pre-ferment is doing. So we're trying to trick the dough into thinking that it's older than it, than it is. In the case of a long fermented dough, which as I said, for me would be three to five day old dough, there's no reason for me to use a pre-ferment because the, basically the whole dough is a pre-ferment. It's all old. If you're doing a 12 hour dough, you might want to consider a pre-ferment to give it some of those complexities that might not be uh, a bit readily available in a young, in what I would consider a 12-hour dough to be a young dough. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan may have a different opinion about that, but in in reality, we're trying to accomplish the same thing through different methods. Now, John alluded to digestibility, and um, I think that the the the, the, the certainly different doughs have different digestibility characteristics, but I'm not sure if they're exactly uh, 
created in the way that John thinks they are, because he talked about yeast as being a component of that. Any, any dough that you, that you bake, the yeast cells are going to be dead. A dough, had, a dough to be fully baked has to reach an internal temperature of over 200 degrees. And we know that most living organisms perish at about 140, which is why we have a 40 or 140 uh, danger zone from the health district in, in storage of food. So in reality, after 140 degrees, the yeast has died anyway. Whether it's new dough, young dough, has a lot of yeast, has a, has a, has a, a small amount of yeast. By the time the pizza is completely baked, the yeast is probably pretty much killed anyway. So I'm not sure about the reasons for digestibility, but I think that John is correct that a more mature dough, a dough that's been properly formulated, will seem to be much, will uh, empirically will be much uh, easier on the stomach and much more enjoyable to eat. The method sometimes were uh, an accommodation to the equipment available, you know, so when we talk about classical Neapolitan pizza, the methods developed not necessarily in service to what produces the optimal product, but in service of what do I have available to me in terms of space, in terms of equipment. So, you know, tip, I mean, typically pizzerias, even when I was getting started, everything was dictated by, for lack of a better word, convenience. You know, what mixer did I use? I used the mixer that I found in the building when I rented this space. What oven do I use? I use the oven that was already there. I use the oven that was available to me. What flour do I use? I use the flour that is commonly distributed in the neighborhood that I'm locating my business in. I use the cheese that the local uh, influential padrone of the neighborhood told me that I had to buy. You know, there were other factors involved besides just creating the best product. So in the case of, of Neapolitan pizza, I think that we have to really look, not certainly in terms of classical Neapolitan pizza, you're looking at classical methods, classical ingredients. But as we know, the ingredients have changed over the years. So we have to assume that the product has changed as well. Absolutely. Adolfo Marletta talks about how the flour, he, he talks about how his father at his pizzeria in Las Vegas Tata. Now he's with Pasquale Martushima in Japan for all these years. But he talks about how the, 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 the nuances of grain and, and the flour that was produced in the 60s is different than it was today. So when they talk about the leftover dough, the, the pasta al porto, that they could easily reform the pagnotto and use it the next day because there were various qualities of that dough then that they, there aren't now. Right, and it may not even be a, a, a change that you're aware of. The manufacturer can be manufacturing a product under the same label, but it may have changed over the years based on the, the wheat itself changing, or the tomatoes changing, or what they're, what they're fertilizing with, or what equipment they're using to process, what equipment they use to pick the tomatoes from the vines. All of those things are a factor that you could unconsciously be changing. So you may think that you're doing this, you know, the reference that you made was to the 1960s. If we're talking about just a short time ago, the 1960s was only 60 years ago at most. How much has it changed over the last hundred years? So when people get hung up on authenticity and, and uh, tradition and classical technique and classical ingredients, it would be impossible to, re to truly replicate the pizza that they were making in 1905, in 1920, just 100 years ago, let alone 200 years ago. In, in, in the process that I've, I've, I've gone through, I, I think uh, the making decision about what it is that I want to do, and, and I think it will always be classical Neapolitan. You know, for example, today I, um, I'm doing our, our classic methods but there are two more mixes I'm going to do today. One will be Knoll's three-day, you know, three-day cold ferment uh, uh, for the focaccia with no biga. I, I'm more successful with that right now. I I, I do work with Stefano Tulipano and and using the biga, but I'm not as successful so far in the results uh, with, with with that method. But in the process of taking the the principles I went from from uh, 
uh, from, from Menzo Kocha, I was so excited about, you know, Liebeto Madre using the mother and then very excited with, you know, working with Franco Pepe. And then, and, it, and I saw, and I, I went in this full circle, but I think I've re returned home to the Tipo Classico in terms of the classic method, because I, I, I went from to Franco Pepe and then, and then sure enough, you know, when I always would practice with, uh, with Antonio Sarita, but then when I came back from Franco to really work with Atilio Baguette, who I think of the true pizzaiolo, the true pizzaiolos, pizzaiolo Naples, which was really going back to that classic method again. And it's really wonderful, this process of, of, of trying the other methods to see which pieces you may incorporate into your method or to understand why your method is the one that you want to take. So it's always good to go out of the box because it can, and, and, and with all the mistakes and, and all the failures you make, but it, just, it, it gives you more knowledge to figure out what pieces work for what you want to do versus what you didn't want to do from before. To get, to get the result that you're, that you're striving for, um, that's where experience comes in. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you may be able to, your dough may not be exactly the same at the beginning of the day as it is at the end of the day, but if, you're, if you have a skilled pizzaiolo and a skilled person on the oven, the finished product should be, should be very similar. Yeah, How but- you got there may be slightly different. Yeah, but for example, if you were at Don Michele, I think it's better that you go at three in the afternoon than at eleven o'clock in the morning. So you know, if you if you go to Don Michele, if you you're able to be witness in in you you'll see that they got three different doughs going. You know, one the first morning, the first and 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 same with Antonio Sarita. I think he will acknowledge that there may be dough left in the you know in the fridge. So you often may see dough from the fridges the first round that they pull out first thing in the morning. Don McKelly, you may see the big vat, uh, the dough that they're going to just starting to pull out and they're going to roll that's been going for 24 hours. And then there'll be another mix uh, in the, that's going that morning, which may be uh, that they'll use as auxiliary at the end of the evening. So each, each pizzeria uh, you know, has, has their methods. So one of the keys is to understand the methods of those pizzerias and to time it so you know which is the dough that's best to use. Now, if you're accomplished, then you may figure out it's not necessarily the first dough is going to be the refrigeration because you may take that dough out and allow it such a time lag. They talk about for every hour of flight may be an hour of day of recuperation. So for every hour that the dough is in the fridge may take an hour to recuperate so it's ambient temperature. So when I come in as the Mad Hatter in the morning, I look at the dough in the fridge, I look at the dough in the wine room, I look at the dough that's sitting usually right behind me right here, and then I pick and choose which one I use first. Again, it goes back to, it's the worst method for somebody who's got 10 locations. You can't depend on 10 different dough managers all doing the same thing. Truly a reflection of inconsistency, but I still have fun because I just have the one location that I can try to play for that, for the choices those days be accurate for that day. I may have as volume mistake for the next day, but I still enjoy that process. I know you're very proud of the Sicilian, and I'm, and I and I, I I know you're very excited when your 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 pizza cutter. We can hear that crunch. Can you tell me what is the 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 essence? What are you looking for in the qualities when you're proudly sharing your 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 Sicilian, or if it's another one? What are the things that you're looking for, John? That's a great question, John. The things that I'm looking for in the Sicilian and in, in my New York style or American artisan style pizza in general is contrasts. Contrasts of texture, contrasts of flavor, uh, contrasts of fragrance. I'm looking for complexity. So um, you want, you want uh, to a certain degree, you want the pizza to have a fairly open cell structure, but not open like a ciabatta. Okay, you want it. You want the the bottom of the pizza to be very crispy. You want the interior of the pizza to be be delicate when you bite when you bite into it. But it has to have enough strength to support the toppings as well. You want the fragrance to ha to have complexity. You want there to be a little bit of uh, certainly not sour, but you want it to you want it to have some uh, acidity, and you want it to also have some sweetness. So it's about getting those balances and getting, not getting any one 
uh, component to overpower the others. So for me to get to do that, I developed methods and techniques to get it to be to perform the way I the want the way I wanted to consistently, and get that crunch and get that also get that lightness. I want that I want when I when you pick up that pizza, I want you to be shocked at how light it feels in contrast to how heavy it looks. <laughs> so that surprise is really is really a part of the, enjoying the pizza, and we can see that you know I saw that. At New York Pizza Festival, especially where people would come up to the up to the table, and pick up the slice, and it was almost like the slice started to float started to float out of their hands, and you could see the look of surprise in their faces because it was completely not what they were expecting. So then everything is in service to how do I get there? But you know, for the for the wood burning oven, for example, there are things changing during the course of the day that are beyond your control, including in some cases, the quality of the wood or the properties of the wood, changing from time of year to, you know, from different times of year, certainly, different sources, humidity levels, you know, uh, change, the, change something in that piece of equipment, you change the end result. And if you want the product to be consistent, you have to have skilled pizzaiolos who can make the, who can adapt to those changing conditions and still get a pizza that approximates your ideal. Mm -hmm. And that's un that's understanding, you know, there might be times I've heard you talk about how you always turn the pizza and put it back in exactly the same spot that you start that, that it came from. Depending on the conditions of the oven, that could not that may not be exactly true. In my experience, it may be necessary to take that pizza and move it to a different spot to finish it, or to pick the I think you call it doming. Where you pick the pizza up because the because the top of the pizza is not cooking at the rate that you want it to. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. that's, that's in response to the changing conditions of the ingredients, the pizzaiolo himself, what's on the pizza, and the equip the condition of the equipment. So we're constantly having the that human element. That's that craft that craftsmanship. It's constantly being tested by ever-changing ingredients, ever-changing by ingredients, I mean components of the and conditions in the pizzeria itself. But I I, I look for the, the dough to be soft and pliable. I do look for maybe a, um, a, a little bit of resistance that there could be a little bit of a crunch, but I definitely look for something that has a, a wonderful chew to it. If you take our, you know, for me, the, the essence of Neapolitan is the portfolio, the libretto. You hold it and then you take it away as a, as a street food. As I, I made mention of uh, uh, earlier growing up and, and my pizza, my pizzeria was Albanese. When you took that pizza, you couldn't pick, a, you couldn't pick up a slice without folding the tip in and then creasing it and folding it. It just had to there was a softness to the dough. You know, there was that essence of bread to it. It wasn't, uh, it didn't have that crunch, which I love. I mean, I love chew. I love gummy bears. I like juju bees. I like the chew. But with my pizza, I really like the soft textural, the soft texture of a foldable bread to it. Uh, and, and for me, the, the, as John was saying, is, you know, it's not one ingredient, it's not one component, but it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the marriage of the various ingredients. So can I just finish with this? Uh, as you can see in our discussion, John and I are truly different in, in terms of our experience, our, our understanding of why we do what we're doing. I look forward to many more years of, of following John and being able to ask him questions as I, ask questions to Mauro Caputo and to others that I follow in Naples. But I, I think there's really um, a common element between John and I, and I think many of the pizza makers who were, who were part of this wonderful family, uh, whether it's with Molino Caputo, uh, whatever the flower that we're using. I just, if you look at Will Grant, for example, I was just watching him, this, I was not watching, I was looking at uh, uh, some images I saw of his on Facebook. And what I usually see is Will um, not only showing an image of his pizza, but 
showing a picture of he and his wife and his child. And there's this in, incredible uh, love uh, and sentiment. And I think that's really what this is all about is our sense of, uh, you know, being with family, being with friends, being with the people in our quartier, our, our neighborhood, and trying to do something that we can share. I touched upon before, I think John will talk about our hands and that, that when we make our, our dough, we're, we're in, that, in that dough is a lifelong experience, a lifelong of memories that we have that go day to day into our, our, into our methods and that we try each day to do our best. It's not always, uh, but what's wonderful is we take from those experiences uh, you know, the, 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 the knowledge from our mistakes to do something better that we always aspire to, to make uh, the profile of pizza, whether it's what John was talking about with the Sicilian or what I talk about with the Neapolitan or whoever else you, you talk to about pizza. But we're really trying to do something that has our heart in, in that's also an ingredient in the dough. And even if someday we you know some days we don't make the best pizza, but if we still aspire to be one with our community and and to be whole in that sense, that I feel comfortable. And John, you may think a little differently, but I don't think so. What do you have to say? We started out this conversation at the very beginning, talking about the importance of time, how time is an element of, of our dough. And we were talking about time in terms of three days, five days, 12 hours. But if we really look at it in a, in a more complete sense, we're talking about time, meaning from the day we were born until the exact moment that we are touching that pizza and constructing and bringing that pizza to fruition. Everything that we've experienced in our lives up to that exact moment that we take that dough out of the tray, that we shape that dough, that we top it, that we bake it, should be reflected in the finished product. Our pizza is a, should always be a, should be always be an expression of the sum total of who we are at that exact moment. And in that regard, our pizza is always changing because we're always we're always changing. When John goes to the pizzeria today, he's not exactly the same person that he was yesterday. When I go to the pizzeria tomorrow, I will have been changed by this conversation, and hopefully my my pizza will be influenced by that. And in that way. Our, our pizza becomes a time machine and our pizza becomes uh, a way of giving immortality to all of the people that influenced us over the years. If we're mindful of that, if we're respectful of the fact, and I'm sure John has people that have influenced him that perhaps are not, not around anymore, but he remembers them when he touches the dough and he brings a piece of them, to, he gives them immortality because the pizza has been, his pizza and who he is as a person have become one. And that's what I think we're all striving for. When we talk about our pizza community, we're talking about keeping something alive, not just for ourselves, but for eternity, for the next generation to experience and enjoy and be influenced by. And something that Jonathan taught someone five years ago will be passed on to somebody 20 years from now in some sense. And, and John will live forever through what, he, what he's passed on to people. Not, in, not just in terms of technique or formulas, but also in terms of demonstrating how to fall in love with humanity and ex express that, that, that love of humanity through the food. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for the time, I'm honored. Um, uh, as always, to uh, to be alongside uh, my my good friend John Arena, uh, who I've learned from over the years. Uh, we are a, a group, part of a great community. I'm I'm happy to uh, to share what I have with uh, with everyone who's watching right now. I look forward to. Uh, the day we're all together in the Bronx uh, again for the New York Pizza Festival. So 
I, I hope this uh, is something that will be a contribution significant enough so people will uh, want to talk to us when they see us in the Bronx at a later date. So I, I, I thank you very much. I thank Antimo Caputo, Vino Putolo, Fred Mortati, everybody at Orlando Foods, but I also uh, want to thank directly to my um, my good friend, John Reno. Thank you, John. Jonathan, it's always wonderful to spend time with you. And for me, of course, I love our craft. I love our community. And most of all, I love the friendship that has been developed between many of the pizza makers, especially you, who I consider to be a true brother, mentor, colleague, and dear friend. I love being able to spend time with you and share our thoughts and passion and craft with the viewers. And I'm really grateful to Orlando Foods and New York Pizza Festival and to Mo Caputo and, the, and his wonderful company, Fred Mortadi, all the people that have brought us together and enriched our lives. So thank you very much. This is wonderful.